Hey everybody, I'm Steve Wexler, delighted to be here. And let me share my screen and we will get started. So, how to get your organization to value data visualization and you. I show this next slide in virtually every workshop and presentation you are encouraged to disagree with me. I know this forum doesn't make it that easy, but during the Q&A or something like that, uh, good things happen when we debate things related to data visualization. So if I'm saying something that doesn't resonate with you or you're going, wait a minute, that hasn't been my experience, bring it up in the Q&A, send me a note, email, tweet something saying that I don't know what I'm talking about, whatever, and we can have a discussion about it. So this is a... Um, an imagined version of me um, pretty much before every workshop, you know, that I'm always a, a little fearful. Um, and in particular, before I do the very first part of the workshop, which is the fundamentals of data visualization. And I'm thinking, doesn't everybody already know this? I mean, you know, a lot of stuff I'm covering is, is it's been around for hundreds of years. Um, and it becomes evident really quickly that not everybody knows it or they haven't seen it or considered it in certain ways. There are a lot of ahas just in the first 30 minutes. But the other thing that occurs to me is that these are data practitioners that are in the data visualization practitioners that are in this. Um, not people who are consuming charts and dashboards, the people who are making them. And if they don't know some of these things, what about the people who are consuming the stuff they're making? So that's one thing that, that, that's come about. And the other is the attendees, they get data visualization. They know how powerful it can be, how transformative it can be. But their stakeholders, their clients, their colleagues, their boss, doesn't yet really value it. And I've got to say, if your organization doesn't value data visualization, they're probably not going to value the data visualization practitioner. And, and that's too bad because there's so much that you bring to the table. Well, in any cases, we're discussing, well, why isn't it these people don't like charts and graphs? Well, it's they cling to their spreadsheets. They want everything displayed in a crosstab or in a spreadsheet. So we need to try to show them why just the numbers isn't good enough. And if I were to encapsulate every client that I've had over the last 16 years that really wants to see their spreadsheets, this is sort of an amalgam of every client and their stubbornness. You can have my spreadsheet when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. Well, how are we going to win them over? And one way is to say, well, what are the questions we're trying to answer here? So here's a typical spreadsheet. It's showing sales over a 12-month period for three categories. And let's say you were to ask your stakeholder, which category, consumer, corporate, or education, that's what we have along the left side over here, which of these had the overall, had the largest sales, and which were the lowest? And they'd say, well, that's easy. I don't have to look at the numbers. I can just put a total in there, and I can see immediately, boom. Corporate is higher than consumer, is higher than education. Good point, put the totals in, they win that round. Now ask another question. In which months was that not the case? In which months was corporate not the top seller? And did it dip to second or third? Did it dip a little bit or did it lip, dip a huge amount? Well, that's a much harder question to answer with a table full of numbers. But if you display it as a line chart, it just screams. Look at that. By the way, this is a good use of direct labeling. By direct labeling, I'm referring to this part that's over here. Know that I've got the uh, uh, what the categories are. The names of them are right next to the line. I don't have to go to a legend to go, what does orange mean? In any case, you can look at this and see immediately, oh, corporate is on top most of the time. But what's up there? There was a huge dip in March. And, and if I were looking at this, I'd want to know what happened in March. That's a good visualization, by the way, one that asks questions 
doesn't just answer them. You could probably also see there was a big do dip in July for consumer. I'd want to know what caused that. What do we need to do so this doesn't happen again next year? Very hard to see that in the spreadsheet. Super easy to see it in the line chart. Still, this person may desperately, or these people may desperately want to see their numbers. So how can we get them more comfortable with what it is you can bring to the table? And maybe you show them a highlight table, or as I call it, the gateway drug to data visualization. Um, a term for it is a highlight table. If you're an Excelian, you may know this as uh, conditional formatting. In any case, what have I got here? It is a simple cross tab or spreadsheet. I've got four regions along the top and I've got 17 different product subcategories. So there's a total of 68 different numbers. See if you can spot which combination of region and product subcategory, which is the most profitable and which is the least profitable. You've got to scan through a lot of numbers. And maybe the fastest person I've seen do this and get it right does it in about 15 seconds. Anyone who does it faster than that, they're likely to miss. In any case, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the worst is tables in the east and the top is office machines in the south. Well, what can you do to help somebody see that faster? Who still is, insists on seeing all the numbers? Well, maybe present it like this. I can see immediately, boom, dark orange, worst, dark blue, best. A bunch of other things pop out as well. I can see the tables in general, a lot of orange, only one place is it profitable. And I can see binders and binders, binder and accessories are doing really well. So you've, you've, you've still given them the numbers, but you've made it so much easier to see uh, poor performers and good performers. Let's take this one step further. Got another example here. This is um, technical support calls by hour and day of week. And you can probably see, you know, pockets where, ooh, it's dark orange and there's a lot of call activity. Now you can see that's the most, there's a lot here. And there's very little, you know, the early morning hours. Great. What more could you do with this? Let me ask you another question, a very reasonable one. On what hour of the day do you get more calls than any other hour? And what day of the week do you get the most? Oh, that's pretty hard to figure out. But if we add a marginal histogram to this, can answer the question immediately. Along the right side, I can see where's the biggest bar? Where's the smallest bar? Same with along the bottom. And I can now answer that question succinctly and quickly. Well, let's play devil's advocate and go, well, wait a minute. You know, why don't you just put totals on this thing? All right, this is not so easy. Yes, I've got the totals, but I've got to go through all those numbers sequentially and try to remember which number was big, which one wasn't, same along the bottom. And if I color code them, well, that works great for the total, but the, the inside of the table gets totally washed out because the numbers are so much smaller. Well, let's go a little further on this. And, and, and again, I'm trying to advocate, hey, color was great, but we can do a little better than color. I just wanna look at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Well, I think we can all see that 11 a.m. is about twice as big as 10 a.m. How do we know that? Because we can look at the numbers that are in there, 1376 and 672, that's about twice as big. Suppose I take the numbers out. I can't tell that's twice as big. Look what happens with the bar chart. I remove the numbers. I can absolutely see that that's about twice as big. By the way, this removing the numbers technique is a great way to test the potency of your visualization. Can somebody still understand it? I wanna show you a cool quote. We can say that one shade is darker than in the other. That is obvious. But to say that it is two or three times as dark is not visible. It is not readable. And do you know who said that? Charles Menard in 1861, you know, guy who did the famous uh, Napoleon uh, military campaign to conquer Russia. Uh, by the way, the translation from the French comes 
from my friend uh, and colleague R.J. Andrews. Thank you for that, R.J. All right, that is the first way to kind of get somebody into this and embrace it. Oh, you still gave me my numbers. Oh, you're now using color. That's very helpful. Hey, these bars are more helpful still. Here's another way that you can start to make data visualization um, irresistible and, and change behavior. And that is to make the dashboards and visualization uh, not just uh, something that's important to your audience, but see if there's a way to actually insert them into the discussion. So what is this data here? It's a population or age histogram for people living in the United States. This is based on 2019 census data. And the way to read this is, okay, zero, those are newborns and there are roughly 3.8 million of them. And 30 year olds, there's about 4.8 million. And 45 year olds, there's kind of a dip over here. There's a huge dip around 73 or 74. Now, I look at that and go, wow, that looks really interesting. I wonder what caused that. My friends and family, eh, they're a little bored by this. But I fashioned a dashboard which makes my friends and family and anyone who happens to visit it the focus of it. They can click any bar and say, click your age, and you can see how much older or younger you are than other people. You can go to datarevelations.com and try this for yourself. Just realize if you're over the age of 50, this is kind of depressing. But it becomes magnetic because a person will immediately put their age and gender in and see how much older or younger they are than others. Then they'll put their partner and their kids and their parents and their older sibling or something like that. And they now have a pretty good understanding of the data and where they are within it. It never fails, which is why um, something like this that appeared in the New York Times, the, the, the um, digital version of the New York Times, find your place in the vaccine line. And if, if this is a this is, um, hot topic right now. When am I gonna get my vaccine? And you could put in information about yourself and it would calculate things. And then it would say, based on where you live and your background and your age, Here's where you are in line. So I've just given you, you know, two pieces of, of ammunition that I think will help you um, get people to see uh, how potent this can be. One is ask questions and show them how just the numbers, you can do way better than that. And if they don't like line charts or other things with which they're not familiar, try a highlight table then, and then build the marginal histogram. Well, let's say you've gone a little further in your journey and you're now dealing with people that, that are excited about this, but they're making some bad recommendations. So I want to discuss how to win a data viz argument because stuff's going to come up and you're going to go, uh oh, that's a bad idea. How do I show them this may not be the best thing to do? Let me give you some examples. You know, this dashboard's boring. You got too many bar charts, you know. I saw something with packed bubbles that look really cool. Do something with packed bubbles. This dashboard isn't colorful enough. Use a lot more colors. Hey, everybody knows what red and green mean. Use red and green. And pie charts are great. And donut charts are even better. Uh, there's an icon we use in the big book of dashboards, my fellow authors and I. And I'm also using it in a new book that's called um, The Cat. Sometimes we call it the screaming cat. I call it a scaredy cat. It, it means these are not things you should be doing. Well, are you prepared to address these issues? And you don't want to come in as a, a caustic know-it-all. Um, I loved this book when my kids were younger. Um, I loved reading this to them. It's called Hawaii for Watney Wat. And, and uh, a rodent who had a speech impediment, but ended up saving the day. And there was this transfer student, which is the largest rodent on the planet, Camilla Capybara. And she kind of came in like this. I'm bigger than any of you, I'm meaner than any of you, and I'm smarter than any of you. So there. You don't want to be that person as you're trying to get people to embrace this. So, all right. Bar charts are boring. Use pack bubbles instead. How are you going to win people over? 
time is precious at, at the moment. Um, here's something that you can go at your leisure. You try it and then you can send um, your stakeholders to bigpick.me slash estimate and see how good people are at being able to judge the size of circles or it's specifically the area of circles versus the length of bars. And it is amazing how much better people are at bars than circles. And here's an example that uh, Professor Matthew Kay shows. I first saw this at a conference and it blew me away um, doing this concentric circles. Ask somebody, what percentage of the larger circle is the smaller circle? Most people will say 75%. It's 50%. The big one is twice as big as the small one, which is why I cried a little bit when the Wall Street Journal recently ran this to try to show um, excess deaths um, that, that there, there are, in addition to COVID, there are also um, other more deaths than usual that may be COVID related. How do we show this? And that, that biggest semicircle, the excess deaths, it's, it's, it's about twice as big. And it's, it's hard to judge that. So this is, you know, it's, it's, it's an alluring graphic, but in terms of humans being able to make a good comparison with us, um, we're not good at it. So it was disappointing to see this is the way to show the outside circle is twice as big as the other. Um, I do want to discuss this one. Pie charts are great and donut charts are even better. You know, we've all heard, um, oh gosh, avoid donut uh, pie charts. They're terrible. Well, they in fact have their place. This is not one of those places. I think this is a you know bad use of a pie chart. Um, you know, imagine if you had 17 segments. Um, yeah, I can see which is largest, but then um, is copiers bigger than machines? How much bigger is chairs than tables? Um, a pie chart does one thing. It allows to show part to whole relationship and only for two of the slices. I'll try to explain what I mean there. But trying to see you know, how much bigger is this than the other? So let's focus on tables for a minute. I'm going to show you a good use of a pie chart. How large a slice is that? It's a little hard to tell. Some people who are really well schooled in this can say, oh, I can see that's about one quarter. Most people can't. I'll then ask you, is it exactly one quarter? Is it a little more than one quarter? Is it a little less than one quarter? And you're gonna just go, I don't know. But if I move this, so it starts at midnight and goes counterclockwise, darn if I can't see that. It's a little less than 25%. It's an instant read. By the way, because we're starting from this reference point, this baseline, it's why these incredibly hip measuring cups are instant reads. One quarter, one third, half full. Uh, these come from Welcome Industries. You can buy them if you want. So one slice or uh, uh, compared to the whole is it really easy to make a, an accurate comparison. This, however, if I ask you which is bigger, copiers or machines, that's, that's pretty tough, which is why the bar chart works much better. One, I can see that, that machines is a little more than copiers over here. And in fact, I can also see the chairs is about twice as big as machines. Now, the pie chart has its place. And in fact, it works great when married with a bar chart. So right now, best practice, sort the bars from high to low. But suppose I want to know what percentage of the total is California? Oh, maybe make a little interactive dashboard. Oh, select California. It's a little less than one quarter. Or I can select a whole bunch of states. I've got seven states selected and I can see it's a little less than one half. All right, let's discuss the donut chart. And this made me cry a little bit inside when I saw it, uh, this on Tableau's website. I have no problem with a single donut chart like this and just two segments. That's a really easy read, even without the number in it. I can see we're 40, you know, a little less than halfway towards our goal. It becomes really hard to compare the 70 versus the 45 versus the 35. Also, I've got north, south, and east. 
why, did, why am I not showing West? Do we not have a Western region? It's because West crushed it and they reached 105% of gold. How do you show 105% on a donut chart? Compare that with the bars with a reference line. Instant read. By the way, look at North and East, the second bar and the fourth bar. I can see it's twice as big. So here's the donut chart version and the comparisons across is really difficult. And here's the bar chart version. One more example where now it's not, it's actuals versus um, uh, percentage of 100% of, of goal. Look at the things that I can really easily see. I can see that for the East, chairs is twice as big as copiers. And overall, I can see tables is a little bigger than machines. But I can see that machines for the East is a little larger than tables. Try this with a donut chart. It's useless. Try to make any type of meaningful comparison with this. You've got something that's useful with the bars or the stack bars. You've got something that's not very useful, but it looks pretty with the multi-sized donut charts. Realize as you are nursing these people, as you're nurturing them, better word, they're not your adversaries, they're your stakeholders, and they should be your collaborators. Get them involved with what you're making, get their feedback, say, show them two or three different approaches, all of which are good. You know, there's usually more than one good way to fashion a chart or dashboard. Gee, should I use a lollipop chart, um, a Wilkinson dot plot or a bar chart? Get them involved and you'll make better stuff. Collaboration isn't me saying red and you saying blue and us agreeing on purple. That's compromise. Collaboration is when we make something together that is better than what either of us would have made separately. Uh, let me just give a quick pitch for a couple of things. Um, this is the book that I had the pleasure of writing with Jeff Schaefer and Andy Cotgrave, uh, The Big Book of Dashboards. This is for the practitioner people who are going to be designing um, dashboards. Um, a new book coming out in May, The Big Picture, How to Use Data Visualization to Make Better Decisions Faster. This is for your stakeholders. This is to get them up to speed with what data visualization can do and just how much you bring to the table as being able to uh, create these things. Um, would love to continue the discussion with you. Um, now and also uh, afterwards. So here's the information for me. My website is datarevelations.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at data revelations and feel free to send me an email at swexler at data And um, delighted to spend time with you and answer some questions. And uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing in a moment. <laughs>